ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, we're going to be talking about arbitration in this video. We're we also going to do another video right after this, and then i got to get to my work because I have some arbitrations that I have to do today. And let me explain something to all of you. I'm an independent arbitrator for not only the Foundation, but also the Securities Acquisition Trust Commission. I'm not going to tell you the name of all the other arbitration associations that we formed. Didn't do this to collude or get around anything. I did this because I had the right to do it. And my job is to, as an arbitrator, to be fair and open-minded. I cannot, cannot sit up there and violate those principles as the God I serve will not allow me. Now, mind you, the God I serve, his name is Jehovah. He requires that I be honest in all things, not just in some things. Now, this means that I don't bring my belief into the arbitration process. No, my functions as an arbitrator is to look at the contract and make a decision governed by that instrument and the United States Arbitration Act, otherwise known as the Federal Arbitration Act. Just in a previous video, and that video talked about how arbitrators perform a judicial function. And as long as they are performing a judicial function, making a determination between parties, then they are valid arbitrators. Now, in order to issue a valid arbitration award, the law has already been very specific. They must give the opportunity for the parties to participate in the hearing. Now, the hearing does not have to be in person. The hearing can be as all of SAA's hearings have been, de novo. That means with no parties present because they can do like you do in most courts. You send them paperwork, and they look at the paperwork, and they make a determination based upon the motions submitted by the parties. We do the exact same thing. But sometimes, let's say an attorney steps in. Well, as an arbitrator, this is how I work. Ladies and gentlemen, just because you're an attorney doesn't give you the automatic right of entering the process. You're not listed on the contract. If you're not listed on the contract, then you're going to have to show proof that you have the right to speak on that party's behalf. If you don't show proof that you have the right to speak on that party's behalf, whatever you've submitted will be ignored. You're not a party to the instant matter. See, that's why an attorney, when he goes into a courtroom, he has to produce what's known as a notice of appearance. But see, the courts are not as stringent as I am. The courts will allow any attorney who is an officer of their court to claim that they represent another party. You don't get to do that with me as an arbitrator. No, as an arbitrator, you want to represent another party, then you need to show power of attorney. The same thing that they would make me show if I wanted to speak on your behalf. They would demand that I show power of attorney, showing that I have the right to speak for you. Go ahead and call up any one of the financial institutions and tell them you're calling on behalf of Johnny May Barry. And Johnny May Barry sits up there and gives you permission but doesn't tell the bank that they're giving you permission. What's the first thing? They're going to say, well, I do not see your name on the file here, and so we're going to need proof uh, that you have the right to speak on their behalf. And here's the address or the fax information that you can send that information to. But until then, we can't speak with you. We cannot discuss our client's information with you. This happens all the time, every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, I apply the exact same principle. So just because an attorney steps in, and I don't care if the attorneys get mad at what I'm saying, care. If they get mad, they will follow the rules. And the rules say that if they represent a party, they must have a power of attorney. So they're required to show that power of attorney. Just sending a letter saying, I represent somebody, will not work. Not with this arbitrator. In fact, we're going to make that a policy. Say, and all the other arbitration associations that I founded. Because enough of this presuming that one has a power of attorney, because that's what the courts do. Because he's an officer of the card, we extend to him certain courtesy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know Curtis, okay? And I don't know his little offspring. So all the other courtesies, they don't exist in my world. So there are no courtesies 
You will follow the rules. You will follow the law. Now, notice what it says here, ladies and gentlemen, because organizations like Penny Mac and some of the other attorneys and the other banks, because I kept raising the issue in the Penny Mac matter, which we still haven't received a final decision. The, the court literally has refused to enter a final order, even though they supposedly had a bench trial, which nobody asked for. We specifically asked for a trial by jury. And the court knows what we do, what we're doing. Here's the reason. This is the problem that they're having, ladies and gentlemen. According to the law, the judge of a regular court is of the same capacity of an arbitrator. They both perform judicial functions. They're both protected by the same it's called Judicial Immunities Doctrine. If you ever get the chance, just type that in case text. Arbitrators are protected by Judicial Immunities Doctrine. Go ahead and look at that, and you will see exactly what it says. Now, I want you to follow this, if you don't mind. Arbitrators exercise judicial functions. And while they are not EO nominated judges, they are judicial officers. They are judicial officers. They are judicial officers. Do you know how important that is for the courts to say that arbitrators are judicial officers? So you don't get to just say a judicial officer is violating the law. You don't get to just say a judicial officer has entered an invalid order. Ladies and gentlemen, the judges of these superior courts, the judges of these federal district courts are on the same plane as the arbitrator. Don't worry about it. We, we won't go into the detail as to how that is. Just understand they have the very same judicial immunity. They perform the very same judicial function. Now, they may not have been nominated by a particular process, but they were nominated by the party and are protected by Congress because Congress enacted the act. Pay attention. Consideration of public policy are the reasons for the rules. Yeah, it's a public policy thing, ladies and gentlemen. And like other judicial officers, look at that, like other judicial officers documenting again that arbitrators are judicial officers, arbitrators must be free from the fear of reprisal by an unsuccessful litigant. They must of necessity be uninfluenced by any fear of consequences for their act. Ladies and gentlemen, they have been trying to silence and shut down SAA, but as you see, we're not going nowhere. We are protected by the law. Now, the reason why the uh, New York State uh, Appellate Division, well, second district, the reason why this is so important is because when it comes to arbitration, New York leads the way. Okay, you just have to do the history of arbitration and find that if New York makes a decision, all the courts usually tend to conform. It's just they set the policy when it comes to commerce. Be look, that's where the finances are done, is New York. Another policy underlying arbitral immunity stems from the national policy favoring the settlement of labor disputes by arbitration. See, there's a national policy. In light of the encouragement of arbitration, yes, arbitration is encouraged. It's a public policy thing, ladies and gentlemen, and there's a national policy. So arbitration is encouraged as opposed to litigation. And the necessity for arbitrators to facilitate this policy, yes, arbitrators operate out of necessity. It follows that the common law rule protecting arbitrators from suit ought not only be affirmed, but if needed, be expanded. Ladies and gentlemen, not just decided by one court, decided by many. Moreover, the public policy considerations of protecting a judge's or a juror's impartiality, independence, and freedom from undue influence apply with equal force to arbitrators. Finally, and most important, this circuit, the first, well, I don't know, I don't think, I think they're the second circuit, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. This circuit has recently held that arbitrators are immune from civil liability. Look at the Oh, there, the Sixth Circuit. Okay. The court employed the test of functional comparability as enunciated by the Supreme Court in Buds. Yes, I've read over that case. And concluded that such immunity should not only be extended to arbitrators, but should also be extended to boards, 
of supervisors, uh, uh, sponsor arbitration, sorry, boards which sponsor arbitration, such as the court, ladies and gentlemen, because they sponsor arbitration. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, many of you have had arbitrations denied by the court. Do you not understand that that does not invalidate the debt? You need to understand that that does not invalidate the debt. Let me explain to you just briefly why the contract is valid. I think some of you will be able to grasp this. When individuals apply to SAA, hey, we want – yeah, we're going to – I'm going to do that later. Wait, 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 hey, hey, SAA, I'm applying to y'all because I want y'all's uh, information. I, I want y'all's um, – a process. Yeah, I, I'm applying to y'all because I want y'all to handle my arbitration. And SA goes, okay, here's the contract. You need to fill it out. Contract? Yeah, it's our dispute, uh, request for dispute resolution. That's a contract. You need to fill that out. We can't handle that unless you contract with us. Yes, you may have a contract, but now you're going to contract with us so that we can have the power to act. Really? Is that how it's done? Oh, of course that's how it's done. How else are we going to hear your dispute if we don't have a contract with you? And thus, we accept the role as arbitrator, independent arbitrator, because SAA does not arbitrate a single case. They assign it to independent arbitrators, of which I'm one. And then I accept the agreement, and I perform my function as an arbitrator yet under the change in terms of conditions, because, see, some individuals have created arbitration clauses where they dictate to the arbitrator what the arbitrator is and is not going to do, not permitted. And then some people, and there was one gentleman who literally decided to add to our, <laughs> I thought this was so special, decided to add to our dispute resolution request application. And we had to send his stuff, and I'll say stuff for the lack of a better word, back to him, letting him know, oh, no, you will follow our policy. You will follow our policy, or you've got nothing coming. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to use SAA. You can use your own private arbitrator. Knock yourselves out. The only problem is the reason why I use SAA because SAA has an established reputation. SAA is in court right now making sure that it fights for the rights of individuals. SAA has created a name for itself. Despite what you might hear, despite what the courts may or may not say, that stuff is not binding because, as I just showed you, arbitrators perform a judicial function. They have judicial immunity. SAA is a valid arbitration association under law. Why? Because they are a federal arbitration association, not a state arbitration association. The arbitrators under SAA are judicial officers, but they are federal judicial officers because they operate under the authority of the Federal Arbitration Act and the common law, national common law. Not the state common law, but the national common law. You'll hear some people say there is no national common law, but that is a lie. Take a look at the Seventh Amendment. And that will give you an understanding. That's why I choose. SA. This is not an advertisement for SA. This is me telling people, well, hey guys, I want tax credit. I got a lot of bills. These people are coming after me. And if I do it right, I can go ahead and get rid of some of this debt that's been piling up and smothering. It's a legitimate thing. It's a legitimate contract. I'm sending it to them. They have the right to say, no, I opt out of your arbitration clause. But they, you know what they can't do, ladies and gentlemen? They can't opt out of your notice of change in terms of agreement because they have a duty to respond. And if they fail to respond, that's the condition of your contract. Hey, you want to opt out of this? You knock yourself out. But if you fail to provide that information that's been requested and you have a duty to provide that information, then you opt into this agreement by failing to respond because that is a condition of this agreement. That's the technicality.
the courts have been ignoring everything. They've been wanting to focus on other technicalities. They don't get to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, they have to take care of the facts. So look, I can't explain everything to you guys, but I can explain that the arbitration awards are valid, the arbitration awards are binding, and the arbitration awards require certain responses, certain performances by the other party. So does the contract. That's why the templates are there. Again, Bradley Christopher Stark was a genius in creating the templates with the arbitration clause. Well, he didn't actually create the template. He created the original document, and he got most of the information from other templates that have been around, but he added an arbitration clause. I saw what Bradley had done, and all I did was put in some language that solidified the contract that took away certain loopholes that I thought were leaving a person exposed. That's why the contracts are put there, but they are not contracts, ladies and gentlemen. They're just templates. They don't become a contract until the parties add their names. And then at that point, it becomes an individual contract between the individual parties. So it's no longer a template. Once you affix a name and add a sum, oh, by the way, because these contracts all involve commerce, and because they involve an arbitration clause, that makes it federal. That's why the arbitrators are federal officers. Just thought I'd help you guys understand that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is 17 minutes that we've been talking. I am, plus the other 15 minutes, gives it a total of a little bit over 32 minutes by the time this is finished. We're not going to go past 18 minutes. What I am doing is I am trying to let people know if you have an arbitration award issued by an arbitrator, if you have a contract, let's say it hasn't been issued by an arbitrator. You don't have an award. You just have the contract, and you have proof that you sent it to all parties. Ladies and gentlemen, that's notice of a debt. That gives you your being able to do the Schedule C, doing your taxes as a sole proprietor, and listing that as a, an uncollectible debt if the other party has not paid in six months. You need to do a 1099-C for giving the debt. Looks like we're going to go past 18 minutes. You need to do a 1099-C for giving the debt. Look, I do want to tell you this because this is important. We are going to be going to the Internal Revenue Service. Let's see if I have it already pulled up. Uh, this ain't it. That ain't it. That ain't it. And that ain't it. Give me one second. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pause you. Well, you know what? No, I'm not going to pause. And the reason why I'm not going to pause is because right after this, I have to pause. I'm sorry, Rakim. <laughs> to catch another sucker of FNC out there, my strategy has to be tragedy, catastrophe, and after this, you call me your majesty, my melody. Check out my melody. Uh, my melody by Rakim. Okay, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I... R S. Hold on, come on now. T A X C R E D I Credit T R A M S F E R N. No, we're gonna do transfer. Uh, okay, let's do procedure. Now, you see, I have just did IRS tax credits transfer procedures. We're not going to go into detail in this video. I'm just showing you the information. That's why I let you see what I typed in. Now, I could have typed it in a different way, but I want to get there. <laughs> there it is, right at the top. Ladies and gentlemen, for all of you, I told you that my job is to bring this information to your attention and let you know that everything that you hear me talking about, I can prove. You need to be able to prove it as well. So when you type this in, look at the whole page. Are tax credits transferable? How many years can you carry forward a tax credit forever on the federal level? How do I carry forward tax credits? Ladies and gentlemen, here is your research. See, this Internal Revenue Manual 
covers information on tax credit transfer processes. When a federal tax deposit transaction date can be changed, do yourselves a favor. Study. Read it over and over again. Focus on the main section, the section that you are interested in, the section that you know applies. Go over that three or four times. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go to another page. Stay on this page until you have a grasp of the information. And then once you have a grasp of the information you're interested in, which is transferring a tax credit, then you can look up the sub-information, the information that you know is related. But focus on, it's called the topic of conversation. Sorry, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, we have a book called Reasoning from the Scriptures. It had something in there called topic of conversation. Why? Because when we go and we knock on doors, open up! Okay, when we knock on doors, individuals, some churches were teaching people how to respond to us. And so they were coming up with ways to stop our conversation. It was called conversation stoppers. And so what we had to do was we had to say, well, no, 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 okay, we understand that you want to talk about that, but we're not here to talk about that. We're actually here for a reason. See, our job is to talk about God's kingdom. That's what we're here to talk about. Now, if you don't want to talk about that, I understand. But the, the subject you want to talk about, the subject you're bringing up, we're not here to talk about that. Now, what I would tell people, now, if you want to come knock on my door and bring it up as a conversation, we can have that conversation. But that's not the reason I'm here, is to have that conversation. I'm here to talk about the Bible. That conversation doesn't do anything about the Bible. And talking about the Bible doesn't even suggest a conversation about the Bible. So there's a publication that they produced. And it was called Reasoning from the Scriptures, and it had a part in it that said, topic of conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, it was designed to bring us back to the main point, the conversation. So our issue here is tax credits and transference of tax credits, credit transfers. Hey, wait, hold on, hold on. Background, don't care authority, don't care responsibility, don't care. None of that do I care about. Why don't I care about any of that? Because that's not my point. That's not what I'm researching. Wait, credit transfer overview, credit transfer research, requirements for credit transfer. Oh, look, IDRS guidelines for credit transfer. Credit transfers input in the IDRS determining credit, credit transfer format. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the information I'm interested in. I'm only interested in the credit transfer information. Okay? So I'm going to go over everything. Have you gone over it yet? Shut up. Ladies and gentlemen, I haven't gone over this yet. Do you know why I haven't gone over this yet? Why? 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 Z, mother... Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I haven't gone over this yet is because I've been extremely busy trying to take care of so many other things. But I promise you, you have my word that I will be going over this. Now, wait a minute. I want you all to understand something. I didn't have to show this to you, did I? But I am showing this to you, letting you know that everything that I'm doing, the law backs me up. Well, the statute. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, this is where you're going to start. And then after you start here, I want you to pay attention. I want you to pay attention. You have the credits and deductions. You click on this, and this is definitely going to take you to the IRS topic. Okay? Now, refunds, I don't care about refunds. Well, we're eventually going to be talking about refunds, but that's not the main issue right now. So you're not going to go up here. This is not your friend, people. This section up here is not your friend. What you want to do is right here because it's going to be in the Internal Revenue Manual. Look, the, the manual is not the law, people. The manual is not the law, people.
The manual is an administrative tool. That's all it is, administrative. This is not the IRC, the Internal Revenue Code, which is also not law. Need you all to pay attention. But this is where you're going to find their administrative rules and procedures, and that's what you want. So you're going to start with Part 21. Wait, hold on. Let's see what else Part 21 talks about. Like I said, we're not going to go past 30 minutes. You have my word on that. But we're going to find out what Part 21 talks about. We're going to see everything because this is 21. It's got 0 .5, 0 .8 and all that, account management. And, and, and wait, hold on. Let me make this larger for you all. Okay, so you all can see. Then you got account maintenances and taxpayer contact resulting from notice issuing, incoming and outgoing correspondence letters, forms, and information requests. See, it has all of this information here. Look, refund research, refund trace and limited payability, returned refunds, releases, manual refunds, and erroneous refunds, refund offset. Ooh, that's where they take your money, people. These are the codes they're following, ladies and gentlemen. So when the IRS is doing something to you, should you not start doing your own research and finding out what they're doing and how to get around it? This is just me. Hey, carry back. Credit transfer. See, carry back. I don't want to carry back. I want to carry forward. But many people who owe taxes from eight years ago, ah, shooky, shooky now. You're going to have to do some carry backing. Okay, carry backing. That sounds like a football player. Well, yeah, he might be. I don't know. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you have the business tax returns. Now, remember, as we said before, Businesses, they don't do income tax. Businesses do revenue taxes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you all were to operate as a sole proprietor, what does it take to operate as a sole proprietor? Remember, a sole proprietor doesn't need an EIN number. Now, do you know why a sole proprietor doesn't need an EIN number? Because a Social Security operates as an EIN number. I already showed you guys. Go to 363, Code of Federal Regulations, Title 12. No, Title 31. Is it 31363? Yeah, 31. I said Title 12. I apologize. 31 CFR 363.20.22 and point twenty seven. You'll see as you go through there the Social Security number and an EIN number and exchangeable and exchangeable. So you should start operating as a nonprofit organization, ladies and gentlemen, while you're operating as a, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said nonprofit organization. That's because something else is on my mind. Not no. Don't start operating as a nonprofit organization. No, do not uh, erase that. Uh, uh, can you go back and erase that? You can't. Okay, correct it. Okay. No, you don't do it as a nonprofit organization. You do it as a sole proprietor, ladies and gentlemen. Sole proprietor. When you file, sole proprietor. Okay. I, hey, hey. What y'all talking about? I owe money now that I did. Get them tax credits. Go ahead and take it out of that. All right, now leave me alone, mother. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me explain something to you all. Some of you guys are going to be greedy. You're going to want to get every dime, every penny, every nickel. This ain't about dimes, pennies, and nickels. Yes, uh, the dollars are dollar for dollar, but we don't want you going after every dime, penny, and nickel. We want you to be reasonable. We want you to go after a small amount at first. We want you to document everything. But this is research you have to do. Now, some of you are not going to go back and listen to the previous videos on the tax credits. We did a whole tax credit series. You're not going to go back and listen to that. Those of you who are going to do the arbitration, remember, the process for the arbitration, once the arbitrator issues an award, okay, now you have evidence of a debt. Previously, you don't have evidence of a debt. All you have is your word against theirs. Okay? So, but once you get that award, you have a judicial officer making the determination that a debt is outstanding, and after 90 days have passed by, ooh-wee, that's a binding award. Why? Because no one can overturn it. After 90 days, it cannot be overturned. Uh, the Federal Arbitration Act stipulates quite plainly that an award can only be overturned prior to the three months of the issuance of the award and service upon of the award upon the opposing party. Just that simple. Only 90 days. They don't have any other option. After the 90 days, and many of you have had your 90 days expire, 
then you need to start doing your tax credits. Ladies and gentlemen, I said we weren't going to go over 30 minutes, and we went over 30 minutes because I started talking about that other thing. I got to go, y'all. But I hope y'all get the arbitration and the tax credit and the tax transfer and information, and I hope y'all start doing your research. And if you find something unique, you find something, hey, I think he needs to know this, you are. You have my permission to send it to the email address, eon v 3 Do not send it to eon at eon.tv. You will, you will, I will give you a piece of your mind, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. I have work to do. Isley Brothers, can y'all take care of yourselves? You got this? All right. Take care of yourselves, people. I got to go.